Welcome to Wesleyan Community Online. Welcome to Wesleyan Community Online. Hey, my name is Luke. Hi, my name is Graydon. Welcome, Welcome to Showcan Wesleyan Church. Welcome to Wesleyan Community Online. Welcome to Wesleyan Community Online. Would you lift your hands and repeat after me? God is doing good things. God is doing good things in my life. God is doing good things in my church. I believe that God is working. Because Jesus rose from the dead, I now have access to his presence. His resurrection is my resurrection. His resurrection is my resurrection. He alone is worthy of my praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord and Amen. Praise the highway to the throne of God. Praise the highway to the heart of God. Praise the highway to the roof of God.
you just pray with me as we continue to worship the Lord this morning? Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. We thank you for how you have kept us. Thank you, Lord, that you have not let any plague come near us. Thank you, Father, that we are stronger because of this. Lord, we just thank you, Father, that you are making new wine. We thank you, Lord, for creating within us that new wineskin that we have been asking for for several years now. We thank you, Father, as individuals and as in a church, Lord, that you are working, that you are healing our hearts, that you are healing our families, and you're turning our hearts back to you. Lord, there's no better place to be. We thank you that you receive us. We thank you, Lord, that you are more than enough. We thank you, Lord, that you are the promise keeper. And we don't have to worry about what we aren't and what we don't have. But when we give it to you, you take it and you bless it and it is more than enough. So we thank you today that you are more than enough and you are the new wine that is pre permeating our hearts and our souls and causing old wounds to be brand new and healed and whole places where you can dwell. And Lord, would you just pour yourself into us afresh and anew today as never before. Let us know you in new and mighty ways. Take us deeper. Take us higher, O oh God, as we give you all the glory. We thank you, Father, for your provision. We thank you for protection. We thank you, Lord, that in all things, in our questions and our concerns, you are making a way where there seems to be no way. Thank you, Father, that you are the answer in all these things. Lord, we bless each person watching today and in the future days. And we just bless them to know your peace, to know your strength. Would you give them a vision of hope today? Would you just fill them with newness of life? Would you give them visions of them outside and walking and being able to be with their family and family members? And what a day that will be. And Lord, let them remember that it's you that's with them there now. And as they worship you, that hope will fill their hearts and fill their homes and will carry them through this. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to partake in communion with us right now if you'd like to grab some bread and some juice. If you don't have juice, water will do. But let's take a minute and just prepare our hearts. And we practice open communion. You don't have to be a member of the Wesleyan Church to participate, but scriptures, the scripture does warn us that we should, our hearts should be right with the Lord, that we should make sure that we're, uh, that our hearts are clear before him and that there's no sin in our lives. And so I wanna give you an opportunity to just briefly uh, wait on the Lord and prepare your heart. We've been preparing by worshiping and as Dorian has prayed, but let's just prepare our hearts today to come uh, into his presence in this way. Father, thank you for, for your blood that was sh shed and your body that was broken, represented by the juice and the bread. May we never forget your great love for us. May we never forget the price that was paid so that we could be free from sin. May that motivate us, Lord. May that motivate us to live for you with passion and with resolve and with joy in our hearts and with a security and a sense of who we are as your children because of your great love for us, O oh Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Well, the night that, the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and eat it. And whenever you do, remember that it represents my body, which was broken for you. And be thankful. In the same manner, he also took the cup. When he had given thanks, he said, this cup represents my blood, which was shed for you. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Remember my great love for you. This is the blood of the new covenant, the new and better covenant that I have made uh, available to you. And so drink and remember and be thankful.
Would you like to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 21? And while you're looking that up, let me remind you this morning that if you're serious about following Jesus, you're going to want to talk to him when you're not in church. <coughs> Obviously, we're not in church these days, but um, you can talk to him anytime. And we call it a daily quiet time where you talk to him in prayer. Let him talk to you by reading the Bible. And the key isn't just that you've read your Bible and prayed, but the key really <coughs> excuse me, to following Jesus is that you're willing to say, Jesus, you're the boss. I'm going to do things your, your way from now on. It's, that's what uh, following Jesus is all about. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to do what you th want me to do. I'm going to let you call the shots in my life. Let me ask you this. If he's not calling you the shot, if, if he's not calling the shots in your life, who is calling the shots in your life? Well, John chapter 21, I've got kind of a the cross between, I think, Elvis and Joel Osteen going this morning. I'm way overdue for a haircut, but um, a little background information. Jesus had just risen from the dead and had appeared several times to his followers. Um, they had not, he had not yet ascended into heaven, and he was uh, being a bit unpredictable, which God can be sometimes. Let's pick it up at verse 4, John chapter 21. Early the, in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish. But even with so many, it was full of large fish, 153. It's interesting that they counted them. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, and I, and I love this. Sometimes we can complicate following Jesus. And I love this simple invitation. Jesus says, hey, come and have breakfast. Hey, dinner's ready. You know, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, uh, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus reinstates Peter. Verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, now here's the one question. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus goes on to describe how Peter would die. Let's pick it up at verse 21. When Peter saw him, referring to John, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Now, there's a lesson here, isn't there? There's a lesson here. It's almost kind of like, kind of sounds like Jesus said, mind your own business, Peter. If I want him to stay alive until I return, what's that to you? If I have a different plan for him than I have for you, you know, that's, that's my business. Mind your own business. It's like he's saying that. You know, we live in a world where everybody has an opinion about something. If that's only been exasperated with Facebook and social media and everybody has an opinion and Jesus comes along and says, you know what? That's none of your business. Well, so now we have this question in John 21, and it is asked three times. Just one question, do you love me? Do you love me? At some point, at some point, let me say this, we're going to be able to look back on this coronavirus, and uh, it, it's going to be behind us. It's going to be over. They're going to come up with a cure. We're going to, social distancing is going to be a thing of the past. We'll be back to normal, uh, maybe not quite normal. 
I have a th feeling things will never be quite the same as they were, and that's both good and bad, I think. But the crisis is going to be over. You know what? I think that's what was happening in Jesus' day. It's like the crisis of the cross is over, and now the disciples are like, okay, Jesus went through the cross. That was terrible, but he's risen from the dead. Now, is he going to liberate us from the Romans? Like, what What now? What, what are we going to do now? Notice Peter could have asked, Jesus, sorry, Jesus could have asked, Peter, are you sorry for what you did? You, you turned your back on me. You denied me. When I needed you the most, you weren't there. Are you sorry for what you did? Notice he didn't say, Peter, do you promise me that you'll never do it again? Or more theologically sounding, Peter, do you believe in me? No, he says, just one question, Peter, do you love me? If the, as if the answer to that question will solve everything else. Well, several things about that question I want us to look at. Number one, it is a personal question. Do you love me? I don't go around asking strangers, hey, do you love me? You know, I don't ask strangers that question. Um, that's a question I might ask my kids, but not strangers. It's a personal question. It's a personal question, isn't it? To really love someone, you have to know them personally. And that question is the question that Jesus is, ask, is asking all of us today. Um, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's a personal question. And it's an invitation to a relationship. Let me ask you, is it personal for you? Or is this just, oh, well, that's what that pastor believes, or, or that church over there? Or, yeah, it's Easter time is nice to think about it. Is it personal for you? Are there times you want to just cry because of the joy of just being in his presence? Notice that he didn't say, do you love coming to church? Do you love praise and worship music? Do you love sermons? Do you love studying the Bible? It's a personal question, isn't it? Number two, it is possible to love Jesus and really flop sometimes. Now, it's encouraging to me that Jesus would have the faith to even ask that. Uh, you would have thought Jesus would have said, you know what, <clears throat> I know you don't love me. <laughs> because if you would have loved me, if you love me, you wouldn't have turned your back on me when I needed you the most. You know, I know you denied me three times and I'm not even going to bother you to ask whether you love me or not. Know that Jesus understands it. He understands that it is still possible to love him and blow it. It's still possible to love him and, and crash. It's still possible to love him and flop. Now, understanding I'm not making light of sin, not at all. You can't make light of sin. If you think about the cross at all, you can't make light of sin. We can't even go there. But there are simplistic people who would sometimes say, no, if someone really loves the Lord, they would never do that. They would never say that. They would never go there. But Jesus simply asked the question, but do you love me? Do you know, I, know, I know what you did. I know what you did. But I'm going to ask you anyway. Do you love me? Number three, love is never satisfied until it is love back. Um, I remember the first time I expressed my love or my interest to Doreen, the woman that I'm, I've been married now to for uh, 28 years. I wrote her a letter uh, back before. I would have loved email. Oh my goodness, I would have loved email. Would have been so more, much more clear, and I could have, uh, you know, been more clear in my communication. I could have been communicated more often. I didn't have that. I wrote a letter. Well. Writing a letter wasn't exactly the most exciting thing I had ever done. In fact, um, at the time, I had little or no experience in writing a letter. I, in fact, I hated writing letters. I have atrocious handwriting, and so I have to print my printing. It looks awful, and I don't express myself very well. And, and, but I really like this girl, and so I wrote a letter. And it wasn't a very exciting letter, necessarily, but what was exciting is a couple weeks later, I got this pretty pink envelope in the mail, a return letter. And, and love is never satisfied until it is loved back. It was May 5, 1990, the date of my college graduation from Kingswood University. It used to be called Bethany Bible College in Sussex, New Brunswick, Canada. And my girlfriend at the time, Doreen Lamus, 
attended my graduation. Now, it wasn't the smartest thing for her to do. It really wasn't. First of all, Doreen probably should not have attended my graduation because it was scheduled before her graduation, which meant she was in a four-year nursing program at Roberts Wesleyan Church in Rochester, New York. It was a very demanding program, and she was in the middle of finals and getting papers done and books read and assignments completed. And here she left all of that like a week before, a week and a half before, and drove a good three, I don't know, three and a half hours from Rochester, New York, around Lake Ontario, over to Napanee, Ontario, where I'm from my parents are from and linked up with my mom and dad who she had met I think once at that point so these were strangers to her and my little brother would have been about 12 years old at the time she got in the car with strangers drove for 14 hours from where I grew up in Ontario all the way to New Brunswick Sussex New Brunswick Canada to attend my college graduation probably not the smartest thing in the world for her to do but she did it because I think she was starting to love me. And it was during this visit that I, I courageously, when I think about it, I don't think I ever did what I'm about to tell you with anyone other than my mom, okay? And so we went for a walk to a little park in the middle of the town where I, I went to college. And I pulled one of these and we were sat, sitting on the park bench, you know, and I was like, I'm stretching, you know, and I have long arms, so that, that works well for me. And I just kind of slipped my arm around her. And I gave her a little squeeze. And you know what? She squeezed back. It was like, oh, I think she loves me, you know. Well, love is never satisfied until it's loved back. This is why the deepest human pain is to have a broken heart when you love somebody and they, they don't love you back. Do you know it, it breaks God's heart? Knowing that he, he totally, totally gave all. That's an understatement on the cross. And when people reject it and don't respond, it breaks his heart. It breaks his heart. Because love demands to be loved back. It's just the way it is. Love requires. It's always reaching. Peter, do you love me? I love you despite your flop, despite your three-time denial, but do you love me? So that, that is what Jesus is asking all of us today. He's asking you right now in your living room or wherever you're watching this, do you love me? You know what? That's where fervency comes from. It's not because of what we pay our volunteers, because we don't pay our volunteers. I'd love to pay them. We can't pay them. This is where people labor for the Lord. This is where people step up their efforts to serve their community. We call it sign up to serve on the back bulletin board. You know, this is where people share their money for the work of the Lord because of their love for the Lord. When you love, you're going to do something. That's why it says John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the whole Bible. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he took action. He did something. There are always the key words. These are always the key words the, the Lord is focusing on. These are always the key words. Do you love me? Do you love me? I know this. If we make loving Jesus our priority, hear me now. If we make loving Jesus our priority, we'll figure the other stuff out. Well, number four, do you love me more than these? It says in verse 15, when Dora and I were dating, I, what I wanted to know and, and what she wanted to know was not only do you love me, all right? What she wanted to know, what I wanted to know about her is do you love me more than past boyfriends? Do you love me more than uh, I wanted to know on my wedding day for sure? Do you love me more than future guys that will cross your path? And she wanted to know, Andy, will you close the door on the past, will you close the door on those crushes that you had and on those dates that you went on? Will you close the door on the future to women that may cross your path and they may look pretty appealing? Will you love me more than these? Will you love me more than these? And you know what? I never once thought of that as being a radical or unreasonable expectation that she would have and that I would have of her. I never once thought, well, that's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of old fashioned. You know, that's kind of radical and, and, and unreasonable to think that she wants me all to herself. You know what? Can I tell you something today? Jesus is not interested in sharing you 
because of his love for you. Understand this. It's because of his love for you. He's not interested in sharing you with anyone or anything else. He just loves you. And so he asked the question, do you love me more than these? What are the these he is talking about? Is this some kind of competition? No, he's not talking about that. He's saying, do you love me more than, more than your work? Do you love me more than your career? Do you love me more than your gifts? More than the recognition you get from being involved? Do you love me more than your, your house? Your sources of pleasure? Do you love me more than your kids? More than your family? Do you love me more than your education? Do you love me more than these? Now, quick side note, with the COVID-19, um, with COVID-19, suddenly we're awakening, I think, to just how fragile the system is. All right, just to just how fragile our human bodies are, to just how fragile the economy is. And our previous way of life is being shaken up. And that's a little scary. I think that's both good and bad, perhaps. But suddenly our financial investments come into question. Suddenly we're wondering if, if retirement is going to be there. If you wondered before, you probably may. Maybe you're wondering even more now. Uh, suddenly we're being awakened to the possibility that no matter how hard we have worked, our wants might just not be there for us in the future. I'm not predicting doom and gloom. I'm just saying perhaps the, the coronavirus is messing with our idols. The, those things that, that we turn to instead of turning to the Lord. Hmm. Notice he doesn't say, do you love me? Do you love me as, as much? Do you love me as much as you love your money? Do you love me as much as you love your car or your, your possessions, your career, your family? No, he says, do you love me more? Do you love me more? I'm not interested in sharing you. I want you to love me more than these things. In a lot of ways, our current world is being dismantled and untangled if you will, resulting, I hope and I pray, in a spiritual hunger for something solid and something that will satisfy and be long-lasting. And like me, some of you perhaps have never stopped working during this time because your job is considered an essential service. Let me ask you a question. Is Sunday morning an essential service for you? Or is it just a convenience? Well, if the planets are in, in alignment, you know, if, if the weather's good, or if there's not a birthday party scheduled, or if there's not something else, or if I'm not too tired, you know, you know, maybe I'll make it. An, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but is this an essential service for you? I'm reminded in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. That's the very first of the Ten Commandments. Do you know what? That command is still a command today. It's not some kind of a harsh rule that the God is, you know, it's kind of like the judge putting the hammer down. You know what this is about? This is about his great love for us. He doesn't want to share us with anybody. You shall have no other gods before me. I want you all to myself. That's when the relationship works the best. Matthew 22, 37, 38, Jesus was asked, well, what? Okay, Jesus, they're trying to trick him. What's the greatest one? What's the best command or the greatest command? And he said, I'll tell you what the best or the greatest command is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he said this, this is the first and greatest command to put God first in all things. And of course, Jesus is going to ask Peter, do you love me? He even said in Matthew 6, 33, if you seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, you won't have to worry about having what you need. You won't have to worry about your retirement. It doesn't mean you shouldn't plan for your retirement. But if you'll put him first, he'll show you. He'll direct you. He'll provide. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be full of anxiety. You don't have to be full of fear. I want to encourage you today. If you're full of anxiety and fear, just... Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Well, number five, he says, take care of my sheep. Verse 16. Um, I think any parent would say this, but as a parent, I've discovered that when a kindness is expect, expressed to my children, it affects me. When somebody, when somebody a, 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 a business owner, hires my kids, I think, I suddenly think higher of that business. You know, I might not even know who the boss is, but I'm thinking, wow, they must be a great boss. They hired my son or they hired my daughter because I'm so connected to my kids. And when I hear that somebody, you know, is maybe paying my kids, I know full well, more than, you know, the going rate. I'm like, man, it's, it's like loving me when you love my kids. I think any parent would say that. 
I think any parent would say that. It, it's the, maybe the coach that gives, you know, really challenges the team and, and, and causes your kid to excel or the, the person who gives lessons or the teacher that gives extra help. I just, I can't help but not love those people because they've paid attention to my kids and my kids are near and dear to my heart. And I will always be connected to my three boys. I'll always be connected to my daughter. And that's what Jesus was getting at. That's what Jesus was getting at when he said, Simon, son of John, verse 15, look with me. Do you love me more than these? And he said, okay, if you do, feed my, feed my lambs. And then in verse 16, take care of my sheep. Verse 17, feed my sheep. Jesus is saying, if you love me, love my kids. I, I can't separate myself from my kids. You know, Jesus is unable to do that. He, he's just, they're so closely connected. And yet there's this increasingly popular notion, and I've shared this many times, that you can love Jesus and not really love his people. You can love Jesus, and, and I, I love Jesus, but I don't really want to have to deal with people. I don't really want to have to deal with church, you know, or organized religion, or his children. And yet, Jesus actually refers to the church as his body. He doesn't separate the church. He doesn't really separate uh, his children from himself. He's basically saying, if you, love, if you don't love the church, you don't love me. That's what he's really saying. He refers to the church as his bride. I don't know about you, but boy, if you don't like somebody's bride, if you don't like somebody's wife, man, you better be ready to deal with the husband, right? You can't separate the two. You can't love Jesus and not love his children. One of the dangers we're facing in this time of isolation is is that we get used to not having to be around people. Now, if you're an introvert, that's good news. Some, some of you introverts are like, man, I could use another six months of this. This is nice. I don't have to deal with people. Some of you extroverts, you're, you're climbing the walls. You're like, man, can I just go to a concert? Can I just go out to dinner? Can I go to a party? Can I go to a sporting event? Can I go and hang out with my friends? And you're just like climbing the walls. Well, one of the dangers we're facing in this time of isolation is we're getting used to not being around people but we need people. Jesus said, if you love me, you're going you're gonna to take care of each other. One person said it this way, to dwell above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know, no, that's another story. Maybe you feel that way today. Uh, and yet, in, the, in spite of that, in Hebrews 10.25 from the Passion Translation, it says, this is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together. Now, I'm not suggesting we should break the, the social isolation or the social distancing rules. I'm not suggesting that at all and put ourselves at risk. I'm not saying that at all. But he says, this is not a time to neglect meeting together in the ways that we still can. We'll talk about that in a minute, as some have formed the habit of doing, because we need each other. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager, eager to encourage not, not eager to manipulate and control one another. No, he says eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. My brother used to have a saying. He, he got into Apple computers before I ever did. Uh, he, before a lot of people. And he would have this saying, the only people who don't like Apple computers are the people who don't own an Apple computer. And the, insinua the insinuation is, if you had an Apple computer, you would just be in love with an Apple computer because you would understand how wonderful Apple computers are. And I used to hear this all the time. You talk about his Apple computer and, oh, they're so much better than PCs and whatever. Now I have an Apple computer. Well, you know what? The only people who don't love Jesus, I have a thought, the only people that don't love Jesus are the people who haven't experienced Jesus who don't know his love. And I'm looking ahead to the day of Pentecost. It's Sunday, May 31st, I believe, this year. And I'm going to be talking about this, I, I think, quite a bit in the days ahead. But I'm asking for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I'm asking for a new and fresh Pentecost that we would experience in this time. Because you know what? I think we need, uh, it's been referred to as liquid love. We need to a fresh baptism in fire it's been referred to i'm just telling you whatever you want to call it it's when the world was 
flipped upside down and changed. Those disciples were never the same. Even Jesus raising from the dead, being raised from the dead, they, they still were kind of walking around fearful and behind closed doors and we're, we're not sure what was really going on. Well, is he going to rescue us from the Romans? You know, I had all these questions. Who's going to be the first? Blah, blah, blah. And, and, and Jesus come, comes along and he says, The only people who don't love Jesus are the people who have not experienced his love for themselves. Where do you experience his love? It's through his followers. You know what happened on the day of Pentecost, don't you? They were all together. I don't, it's no mistake. It's no mistake. They weren't just off doing their own thing. No, they were all together. What were they doing? They were praying. They were all together in one place when the Holy Spirit come, came and they experienced love like they had never known love before as they were with other followers. You know, it's like the crisis of the cross is over. Jesus is risen from the dead. Easter is behind us and Jesus is risen from the dead and all he wants to know is found in one question. Do you love me? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? What's the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message this morning? I want, you, I want you to just pause and listen for a minute. What's the Holy Spirit been saying to you this morning? I want to challenge you again. It's, it's a personal question. But can you honestly say that you love Jesus more than people? I want to give you a challenge as it relates to other people. In fact, I would encourage you to, if you'd like to make a commitment, to, to email me and just let me know. If you, that, why would I say email me? It's not that I need your email. It's, it just helps you take your commitment more seriously. And so if you'd like to email me, that you, you know, maybe you want to call somebody on the phone. That's still allowed, you know. We can still use the telephone. And just to encourage them and just say, you've been on my mind and just thought I'd say hi. Or maybe send somebody a check in the mail. Maybe just a check for $20. For some people, a check for $20, that would mean a lot. And not just the, the tangible $20, it would just be the thought that would mean as much as the actual money, maybe. Or maybe in, invite someone to join you through, through Zoom or FaceTime if you're, if you're connected in those ways. Or maybe, maybe you just need to take some time with your family. It starts at home, really, doesn't it? Have you prayed with your family today? I know you, if you're a parent, I hope you pray for your, your family members, but why not pray with your family members today? Why not take time when this is over and just pause it? You don't have to use flowery language or anything like that. You don't have to pray for half an hour, but just a, a two minute prayer. Hey God, bless my daughter, bless my son, my wife, spouse, whatever, whoever it is. Lord, this is a hard and unusual time, but would you give them grace? Would you give them the help they need? I love them and I know you love them. Just you know, maybe you'd like to do that. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message today?
riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever. couple reminders for you today before we go. Uh, thank you for sending in the tithe and your offerings. And again, you can send by mail, 19 Du Bois Road, uh, Shokan, New York, 12481. Or you can give online. An, an increasingly, uh, an increasing number of you are giving online. And that's, that's the most, that's the easiest way to do it, really. I want to encourage you with that. Go to our website and just follow the directions, shokanwesleyan.com, and follow the directions. Uh, don't forget that uh, Wednesday is prayer and fasting day. 
Um, thank you for praying and fasting on Wednesdays. It is changing the atmosphere of our church. I'm absolutely convinced of that. If you want to join me for Facebook Live on Wednesday, um, Wednesday at noon, I'm just going to share a short devotional and prayer just to encourage you in your fasting that day. So you can join me for that if you like. Uh, don't forget prayer meeting Wednesday night at 6.30 through Zoom. Um, Sunday mornings, thank you uh, to our leaders, our, our board members and worship team leaders, ministry team members and leaders come at 9 o'clock through Zoom and pray for half an hour. We pray specifically for the church, for the service, that the anointing and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit would be upon our gatherings. And so thank you leaders for, for praying each day. But would you raise day. your hands right now for the blessing of the benediction. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Now go 